In our modern world, any urban, or even rural for that matter, dweller would be terrified of the idea of losing a mobile phone or an internet connection. Just think about it for a moment. A couple of decades ago, such problems were unthinkable. And so was the technology, right? Well, to be fair, electronic communication, that means the transmission of electronic pulses through wires, has been around for a good century and a half. And if we count from the beginnings of optical technology, telecoms are well into their third century. Why don't we take a closer look at the history of communications? The very earliest of long-range communication systems were based on simply visual perception. They might use, say, bonfire smoke as a signal that something had happened. The people who needed to communicate could agree on a specific code, and they might probably make the bonfires blink and that would transmit certain information visually. The first telecom inventors took advantage of that fact. And so it was late in the 18th century that Claude Chap demonstrated his semaphore system, and that encoded information by means of mechanical arms that could be manipulated into different positions, each position signifying a different message. The so-called shift key system was also invented. In other words, a single symbol could be transmitted, and that was understood as a visible configuration of other elements telling a certain story. The next step was to start encoding information into electronic impulses. Electrical telegraph lines soon spanned the whole of Europe and North America. Telephone networks, once they came up, spread to the most remote corners of the planet in no time. They say the telephone was invented by Antonio Miucci, an Italian-American who filed an application for a teletrophone in 1871. Thanks to his efforts, it took telephones just 10 or 15 years to conquer the world. Russia at that time was a leader in telephony. In 1877, just a year after Alexander Graham Bell got his patent, Siemens and Halskia factory in St. Petersburg launched a line of telephones with separate microphones and an earphone. Telephone exchanges were set up in Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kiev and other major cities. They were manually operated, yet had a relatively high capacity. The newly established Russian telephone manufacturing plants produced several top-of-the-line models and manufactured all their own components, such as cases, microphones, contacts, relays and ringers. They also developed and tested new models. In fact, it was only wires that they purchased from other factories. After the 1917 revolution, Russian factories were nationalized. Some of them closed down, but others continued to operate in the same line of business. The former Siemens factory kept producing a model developed before 1918. Surprisingly, just 40 years ago, some of those sturdy little machines were still in service at many rural phone exchanges. The amount of information transmitted during a telephone conversation is so modest by today's standards that metal wires can easily handle the throughput. A fax transmission is a bit trickier, but also feasible with these wires. Incidentally, a single typewritten page sent by Telefax contains as much information as a one-hour telephone conversation. However, with the advent of personal computers using telephone lines for communication, the situation was becoming unsustainable. Wired networks were sort of overwhelmed. The internet required a fundamentally new design for dependable communication. Glass blowers noticed long ago that when a ray of light falls on the end of a thin glass rod, its side surface remains dark, but the other end starts to glow. 
As thin rods evolved into flexible filaments, these could be used, say, for sending light around the corner. Such cables were called light guides, or more commonly, optical fiber. Total reflection has been known to science since Johann Kepler's times. It occurs when a propagating wave strikes a medium boundary at an angle larger than a particular critical angle. If the refractive index is lower on the other side of the boundary and the incident angle is greater than the critical angle, the wave can't pass through and is reflected. This effect is used in today's optical fiber cables. The speed at which light can move through glass is slightly less than through air, and the ratio of these speeds is what we call the refractive index. Now, light waves may have a variety of different wavelengths. Each one can be used to transmit a different signal, right? Well, yes and no. There is a caveat. As the wavelength of light increases, so does the refractive index. Which essentially means that waves of different frequencies will disperse in optical fiber and arrive at the receiver at different times. That doesn't really matter in a telephone conversation since the distortions are fairly small. But this disconcerted behavior can actually ruin a large-scale data transmission. In a graded index fiber, the refraction index changes according to a strict formula. Graded index optical fiber is currently used in telecommunications as well as in other areas that require precise transmission of scientific data, for instance, astrophysics or spectroscopy. We should note that wireless transmission isn't good enough for these purposes. It's not as reliable and may also have a bad effect on the environment. Optical fiber, on the other hand, could be called organic, since it doesn't emit any radiation. A cable made from this material is essentially an isolated pipeline that happens to save valuable resources such as copper or other materials, and the environment too. Optic fiber communication is based on cables that consist of a bunch of quartz glass fibers. These cables aren't easy to manufacture. In order to be used for production, the initial fiber has to pass a test. A light pulse must travel its entire length twice and with no attenuation or distortion. It's worth noting that quality control in this business applies to every stage of manufacturing. Now the fiber is covered with a special lasting paint. Color coding is an important step because it makes life much easier for the cable assembly workers who can then sort the fibers and connect them according to color. At the next step, the fibers are packed in a plastic protective jacket filled with a water repellent jelly. The plastic protects them from mechanical impact while the jelly helps to keep moisture away. Each individual fiber passes through a guide and into a device where it goes through a gel bath and through molten plastic that forms the protective jacket. As the fiber leaves the device, it passes through a long bath of cold water to cool it down before the next operation and to give the protective plastic enough time to set. The assembly-ready fiber is spooled on intermediate reels. Consequently, sophisticated and efficient machines assemble color-coded and jacketed fibers in bunches to make the actual cable. The reeling direction changes at regular intervals, so the cable becomes more flexible. Depending upon its function, a cable may contain from 4 to almost 400 fibers, but usually that number is a multiple of 12. Cables that are designed for particularly important lines are shielded with a corrugated metal sheath and covered by an additional layer of plastic. All cables have to be marked with information about the brand, the number of fibers and length. The final product is spooled onto giant reels. Optical fibers are, of course, wonderful things. But, just as with any cables, 
they are simply a means of transmitting signals. Sustained and efficient communication requires, apart from cabling, a properly designed network. One of the largest such networks has been built in Moscow by the Mastertel company. It was a couple of years after Mastertel had been established in 2002. That was when we launched an optical fiber cable laying subsidiary company. That was a new business that of course took orders from Mastertel, but also from several other operators. There was a certain point when we realized that all of our numerous customers essentially wanted more or less the same thing. We were a contractor, and as such we occasionally had to lay two, three, sometimes more cable lines all along very similar routes. And at the same time, many operators were all showing an interest in internet exchange points. Specifically, those exchange points that were based on the old long-distance phone exchanges in Moscow, particularly numbers 9 and 10. And so what we did was to connect those exchange points with a cable system. And that was followed by a second, using an alternative route. After that, we decided to focus on building a cable system within Moscow that could be used by any operator as the backbone to their internet system. Any construction begins with design, and cable lines are no exception. Engineers select a route based on existing municipal utility tunnels. And if those tunnels are lacking or inconveniently located, or, as often happens in large cities, already packed with other systems, then a new route has to be developed. Project staff determine the amount of cable needed, the brand, and the number of connections, and so on and so forth. Once it's ready, the project can then go to the construction department. Every morning, the department distributes work assignments among its teams. The foreman receives job orders, and the warehouse measures and issues the required amount of cable. All the equipment is loaded into trucks, and the workers leave to go to their sites. In order to lay cables in utility tunnels, you first need to locate and open the wells situated at the extreme points of each segment. If necessary, water has to be pumped out of the well, and this happens fairly often, so the team always has a portable pump to hand. When the well is dry, a special cord is inserted into the channel. Long segments warrant a second cord inserted from the well on the opposite side. The cords have Velcro-like fasteners mounted at their ends. On contact, these ends connect, so a single length of cord is formed across the entire channel. Now the cable is attached to the free end of the cord to be pulled into the tunnel. It's quite an intricate job, especially considering the fact that cable flexible as it is, does consist of glass and needs delicate treatment. In the absence of an existing utility tunnel, for example if a cable has to reach a newly built structure, a ditch has to be dug from the channel and plastic tubing for the cable laid into it. In fact that's a difficult job too, because modern cities are covered with a whole web of communications networks, electric cables and water supply lines. Damaging these systems is out of the question. As far as indoor construction is concerned, optical systems happen to be quite similar to any other. It is essential though that the line should have no sharp turns, and optical fibre must be protected from high temperatures. Over 130 to 140 degrees centigrade, it may well suffer structural changes that could distort the signal, and that's not acceptable under any circumstances. The cable that has been extended into the building is then welded to all indoor equipment strand by strand, using special sleeves. Once all the coatings and grease have been removed, the fibres that need to be connected are clipped using a miniature guillotine to make sure that their ends are perfectly flat. They are then placed into the welding module. 
Now the butt axes are carefully matched and welded using a very short but high voltage pulse. Whenever welding takes place, the process is always followed by a quality control inspection. Indeed, high quality is absolutely fundamental to the cabling business. We all heard of signal attenuation, and that depends on the medium. Any welding joint has an impact on the transmission of light. The medium can become opaque, meaning that light waves reflect off the boundary between the two fibers. As a result of that, the signal gets a lot weaker, and a cable of such inferior quality would completely fail to meet today's standards. A fiber optic network is certainly not an end in itself. It's simply a means of connecting computers that access the Internet. Even Wi-Fi connections eventually need the fiber optic network. The communication systems of today require huge computing resources, and these are provided by multiple servers, large data storage facilities, uninterrupted power supply, and so much more. And that includes data security. The world market responded to this demand by establishing what are now called data centers, and they can be wholly, or sometimes partially, rented out to companies who need them. Modern data centers would barely be able to function without fiber optic networks. A data center houses computer systems and associated components, such as telecommunications and storage systems. By consolidating a large amount of computing resources, these facilities can offer a broad range of information services at affordable prices. They occupy large buildings that feature an advanced computer and telecommunications infrastructure. There's air conditioning and humidity control, fire safety, and dual redundant power supply systems. In the event of a power outage, standby batteries step in even before the hardware has time to stop working. A major outage is addressed by using emergency power generators. The main component of any data center though is the state-of-the-art hardware that takes up hundreds of space on racks and in cabinets. It's worth noting that server availability or uptime, the key criterion for the efficiency of any data center, largely depends on the reliability and quality of communication lines that connect that facility to the outside world. Or you could say, on the quality and performance of the fiber optic network. Large companies and data centers with heavy traffic usually need dedicated lines that no one else uses. These lines are rather poetically known as dark fibers. Well, in contrast to certain other networks, the one that we use was initially constructed in order to be able to lease out dark fibers. Well, they're not actually dark as such. They are, well, what you might call redundant. The leasing company gets access to fiber optic connectivity using a network set between the various addresses that it might need. Well, just to wrap up, it's worth noting that after two centuries of long-distance communication, humanity has sort of returned to transmitting light as the fastest and most efficient means of sending data. Of course, we've changed the medium from air to quartz glass, taking advantage of its transparency to light waves of certain frequencies. And maybe it's something of a paradox. Today's fiber optic systems are not fundamentally different from CHAP's telegraph, just cleverly adapted to silicon oxide. And that's all. A network is like a living organism that keeps developing, growing, branching out, incorporating new designs, materials and technologies. We have come a long way. We've invented semiconductors and lasers, and we know how to measure time to within femtoseconds. And rather proudly, we look back at CHAP's telegraph as a naive and 
perhaps slightly awkward thing of the past. But on the other hand, isn't it intriguing to think how our own grandchildren may react to our cutting-edge technologies of today? <laughs>